so the first thing I want to ask is how you're doing. Oh. With all of this, because obviously we all know how we're doing, but no one ever, I don't feel like we have really gotten to talk to you about how you're oh, doing. Oh, that's so kind. <laughs> Actually, um, this has been some of the most um, difficult administrative times I've ever had. Um, we have a saying that we're building the plane while we're flying it meaning that I don't have anything to fall back on past experience or past processes. And I can't always see what the next thing that arises will be. Uh, but it's just made me um, appreciate our people, our students, our faculty, our staff, because we're all in there wanting to do what's best and best for each other, best for the university, best of what it will take to keep us going. So there's an incredible pride that I have. Um, and I believe we're going to, I believe that we are going to make it. I don't know what make it means, is that we won't go fully remote, we won't have to shut down the campus, but I think it's even more. We're going to, we're going to look back at this period of time and say Utah State did a great job and keeping everybody going, our classes, our activities, our buildings, our education, our research, our outreach, and that we truly did reduce the risk of infection for people that are here um, involved with our campuses. So I just, every day, you know, the first week was scary because we started seeing positive cases and working out our procedures of how we would handle them and what we would do and what we could provide. But we're in week four. We're ending up in the end of week four, and we're stronger now than we were that first week. So I'm very, just, gosh, the pride I have in Utah State is just incredible. So. Yeah, it's good to hear. Um, so, and then you kind of mentioned, you know, you don't really want to go remote. Um, so. You know, schools across the country have announced that they have been quarantining, or they will quarantine the entire student body for two weeks as a result of clusters. The U went online for two weeks, and you know, there's been a lot of universities that have just completely shut down. So, are there any circumstances in which USU would consider taking that step? Yes, there certainly are circumstances, um, and I often get asked how many numbers of positives would it take for us to close. That will not be the basis of it. It will actually be that we can't provide enough support for all of those who need that support, whether it's out in self-isolation because they've been positive or those that have been quarantined because they've been exposed. What I mean there is, you know, we want to make sure that they have access to their classes, that if they're in a resident hall, that they are getting the services they need there, such as food, self-isolation, locations, et cetera, et cetera. So it would be if we can't continue to provide resources to our people. It's actually on the side of what is referred to as case management, not the number of cases we would get, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's the capacity of the university to help those that need the help. And so again, at week four, we're seeing a very constant number of students. It's about three to five positives a day. This last uh, report we had, had a considerably more students, but that's the timing of when test results come in. I'm seeing it on the true day-to-day -day numbers, and that's about what it is. And the reason that those numbers have remained pretty flat is because of the precautions, the preventative measures that our students, our staff, and our faculty are willing to do. So um, in the case of uh, people who are just kind of refusing to participate and, and to take these preventative measures, do you think that the, un the university's reputation will be hurt if cases increase as a result of these students? <laughs> That's a really, uh, really perceptive question, right? Um, well, it would 
but I don't think that's going to happen. We know, and we look across campus, we have about 2% of our people that are just not getting the masks, okay? Whatever reason that is. And, but when I compare that to other universities, that number is much, much smaller than what we're seeing at these other universities when those large outbreaks, those spikes, those areas of hot uh, infections are happening. Now that's on campus. And those are, those are places we can control. Where it really gets worrisome is what happens off campus. And we see that again and again for universities that have had to close. The, the university has that ability to implement and enforce those preventative measurements on where we can. So that's the second part of it. If, uh, if our people are doing um, unsafe practices off campus, that's where the vulnerability is and that's where we will have problems. So I think uh, maybe a few things have happened that have made our people aware that that is where problems can be. And as far as I can tell, they're being very relatively responsible to control those things. And the preventative practice that matters most there, it's not masks. I'm not going to ask people or expect people to wear masks at party or social distance in parties. And, and I mean, have a hand sanitizers at parties. All of those would be fabulous, but I'm not sure we could ask and get people to do that. The key is, if you've been sick or you've been exposed, you are going to have to go into this self-isolation or quarantine. It's just the way it is. You, that's how people who are doing off-campus activities, if they are exposed, if they get sick, then that's the preventative practice they have to focus on. And that stops the infection from going and expanding to other people. So what do we do about students who uh, actively ignore the quarantine measures um, or just continue to spread it? Because, uh, for example, a lot of the sports teams have tested positive or have been just together in large clusters and are ignoring quarantine rules and they're just spreading it more. And I think that's a lot, uh, very worrisome for a lot of students on campus who are trying very hard to um, you know, apply to these uh, guidelines and right. um, follow the pledge when we see stuff like this was an intramural team that, that was a picture on Instagram that we just saw the other day. And that's worrisome to not only me, but a lot of students who are trying very hard to follow these preventive measures. All right, so I'll analyze that picture. First of all, it's outside. Second of all, you use the word they're not following quarantine. We don't know that any of those people should be in quarantine. Sure. Um, so what they're doing is they're not uh, social distancing. Okay, that's what they're doing here. So what do we do about those people? Well, every one of those people needs to be able to say, I'm not positive and I haven't been exposed in the last 14 days. And if they can say that, then I'm okay with them standing in that group photo. But if one of those is positive and or should be in quarantine, that's where the issue is. And I, you mentioned student athletes. Actually, student athletes didn't break quarantine. That's not why large numbers of those are. The reason is because they live together. And so what's happening, we see this in our resident halls, we see it off campus, we see it in groups like this. They're all hanging out. One person becomes infected. They didn't you know, wear masks, they didn't social distance, and now more and more of that group is positive. And so that's, uh, that drives the infection rate percentage. And if it's, so infection rate is what is desirable, is actually less than one. That means we would actually drop in the number of people that are infected. That's probably, I mean, someday maybe we can get there. If the infection rate is one, it means for every one positive, 
one person is infected. And then you would flatten the curve. Where it gets to be bad is when that, pos that infection rate is greater than one. If it's two, it means one positive infects two people. One positive infects five, that's an infection rate of five, et cetera. And at some of the places where they closed down, that infection rate got to be up like 100. One positive person went to a place and activity and literally infected 100 people. And they do think that it's not the asymptomatic people. These are people that suspect or know they are positive. And they go and they're you know, very contagious, very, very contagious. And now larger groups go. So that's where, again, off campus, don't go if you think you are sick or you've been asked to quarantine. That's how we break the chain of infection. Thank you for those clarifications. Do you, um, President, do you want to talk about our health and safety student code requirements too and what we would do if someone All right. does? So we do, we have set up a policy which is uh, under student conduct. And, you know, it's, do you not quite get it? Because it is kind of confusing. When do I self-isolate? What does that mean? When do I quarantine? What does that mean? I have a negative test, but I've still been asked to quarantine. Why is that? Um, so if someone has uh, not followed the directions, the first thing is education. Do you realize why we're asking you to do this? The second one, it sounds a little bit funny. It's like writing on the, the chalkboard, you know, a thousand times, I must wear my mask. It's not quite like that, but it's write a paper on why you need to do this. The third time gets more serious. That um, the third time of refusing to do or not doing a preventative measure. But we also have a clause in there that's egregious or what's the word? Egregious, very deliberate uh, refusal to follow. And that is if you know you are sick and you don't stay in self-isolation, that is going to be a true student conduct issue. We just, I mean, the, the instructions are there. Don't be doing that because that'll raise our infection rate and it's infection rate if it gets to the point where we've now expanded our numbers, our resources, our ability to protect others won't be sufficient. Do you think that you would ever take it to the level of like BYU who's like been expelling students for not following you know, if they get to that third strike and then it's kind of like, you know, end game for them? Well, I mean, it's in our policy, um, you know, it, but it is egregious. Right. It really is egregious. And, you know, to know that you're positive and know that you can infect others and still go out, I don't know, you're not, you're not an Aggie. Yeah. And so do we want you as part of the university? If, if you really can't see why that's important and you don't care that it's important, maybe you do need to leave the university and come back when, uh, when all of these restrictions are not necessary. So in a kind way, I am saying yes. Yeah. Yes, we could. We could because we want to reduce the risk of infection to others. And this person has absolutely caused a problem. And I think that's a very small population. Like, I don't think yeah. a lot of people oh, would yeah. reach that point. That's now. what I'm saying. Yeah. Our community, our campus communities are doing fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Um, do you think this pandemic has brought any lessons or tech improvements you believe will um, impact higher education in the future or oh, even now? Right. Right. Now, I'm sure you folks are all worried that I'm going to say, oh, yeah, online works great. <laughs> um, no, I, you know, this is something I'd like to talk a little more. You know, online, we definitely have a great um, uh, approach to online. As you folks have heard in the past, U.S. News World Report ranks us in the top 10 on our online program. So this is incredible. We know how to do it great. But what's the problem? The problem is that lack of connection, personal connection. 
with both the instructor and the other students in that class. And the vast majority of our people want that connection. That's what they're missing. It's not really the quality of the course. It's they just can't interact with people. Um, so there will be times where an online class works great and we will continue to do those. But we certainly don't see a mass movement towards let's do everything online. Um, what do I see as the changes in the future? Um, well, I think it is, it'll actually probably affect our staff more. Um, as you can see, not everybody's even in my office or over there. They work remote. We're trying to reduce the number, the, the density of people. And a lot of people around campus do have jobs that can be done very, very well remotely. And so could we set up more remote functions where people, and that provides more life, work-life balance. And I'm very open to that. Other jobs, though, of course, need to be on campus, and those will have to continue. So I don't think we'll see much change for our students, but we may ch see changes there. For instance, our counseling, our CAPS, Counseling and Psychological Services, those are almost exclusively being done through t a telehealth approach, which is conferencing, rather than in person right here. And they say it's working great. Uh, it, uh, you know, there's more time to do it, et cetera. Another group that's working that way is advisement. Um, you know, and once we all learn how to do virtual meetings, the cues, the processes, unmute, et cetera, I think that's, that, those will continue because now you can balance work life um, as well as providing those services. Cool. Do you think that, or not do you think, but does Utah State offer um, any other resources to students who may be struggling with online classes besides um, CAPS and advising? Yes. Now, um, that's something very, very important. One of the biggest questions or concerns we have, they don't like online, not just because they think, can't interact, but because they, they don't know how to reach out to their instructors. And we thought about this. This is actually a big problem for our freshmen. Think of them being in a high school. And they're actually told, don't email the teachers outside of the class, right? Don't. That's actually something for FERPA and parental approvals and things. They just don't. So now we bring these students, and they can't be in class. They can't raise their hand. I think of raising their hand or going up to the instructor at the end of the class or before the class. I haven't done this assignment or I have this quick question and the instructor says, okay, let's finish it. Well, now there's no in class. So how do they contact the instructor? It's email, it's access through Canvas. Um, we actually have a, a, a web that website that we've developed on ways to contact your instructor when you're in a remote classroom. Because we realize that not everybody knows how to do that. And our instructors are committed. They're actually worried. They say that. I'm not getting as much contact with the students as I expected. Why aren't they contacting me? So I think we're maybe a little broken there. Like here's a student who needs help. Here's an instructor who's totally ready to help, and we can't, we haven't quite figured out how to get them together. So it's web, it's email the instructor, and that, that can be found through the, the directory, it can be th found through the syllabus, whatever, or go through Canvas and post your questions there. And then use those virtual uh, office hours. Make sure you use those. So I just want to see more connection on um, there. Um, we're actually sending out best practices to our instructor. It doesn't have to be 100% instruction in these days. If you're in a Zoom class, can we actually just have each student say, you know, how we're doing? Um, can we make sure that everybody leaves their audio or their video on? You know, because you start turning that thing off, you're looking at a full screen of blacks and you feel like you're alone and I've had that happen to me 
And I'm like, is anybody even listening to me? Are you, have you guys all walked off to go get a cookie out of the kitchen? And I'm just here babbling. So I think somebody said today that turning your, your video off in a meeting or a class is like putting a bag over your head in face-to-face -face yeah. interactions. It would be. Oh, absolutely. So I think that's a way we can all be more courteous and just those kind of things. Yeah. This is the wave. This is where we're going. So how do we work in a virtual? Because I think it's important to note, to note that it's not just the students that are struggling. It's the, the professors and faculty. We're right. all in this together. So Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, can you share a little bit about why uh, spring break was cut so we could right. add those, those two weeks um, to the end of winter? And why did we do extending winter break instead of perhaps extending summer break instead? Yeah, these are all strategies to help reduce the number of potential positive cases on campus. So in our campus community, again, because we're all here, we're in a location here in Cache Valley or Price or Blanding or Moab where the cases are low. But if we disperse all of our students over spring break and they all run down to Florida, or Sun Valley, or name your favorite place where other college students might be, they have the higher risk of being exposed and therefore expected. And the timing couldn't be worse, right? They leave for a week. They're infected on the fourth day. They don't know. They don't have any symptoms. They come back Monday. They show up in class or show up at an event or they go to an activity over in um, off campus and now they've infected a large number of people that was really that's the whole reason so what we're doing is managing where in some sense where people could be exposed and trying to say we think our campus communities are uh, controlling infection so when do we get them here we watched for two weeks is usually you know where you watch for those infections now we've got that handle let's all stay here together and then at the end now disperse uh, we did that knowing what we know today and that's part of the problem like like what is it going to be like in in january could we do mass testing of everybody and you know we know the positives and we ask them to stay off campus and all the the negatives get to come on campus. But we don't, we don't have that capability now, and so we had to determine what we were gonna do in spring with what we know now. So could it change? Could it have been different if we could have made that decision right there, but it wasn't positive, or it wasn't able at this point. So I hope that makes sense. It wasn't that none of us thought we needed yeah. breaks. Oh, no. It's the same thing with Thanksgiving. Again, that's not only students leaving, but everybody goes somewhere for Thanksgiving. So now we have the 3,000 staff people all going to Boise yeah. or flying to New York. Where would I go? Actually, I stay in town, but my family comes. And they're coming from Boise and Salt Lake and Nevada, et cetera. So the chance of exposure and there for infection and then I we all show up back on campus on Monday yeah. so it, it's more management of potential infections is why we're doing these things thank you um, the last couple of questions I have are kind of about seniors this year um, so obviously last semester we had to make a very difficult yes. choice to cancel commencement um, what do you think commencement will look like this year and you know what is being done to kind of give seniors a memorable and enjoyable last year yeah, so the first thing is, I have a saying that I won't predict, I can predict tomorrow, but I can't predict beyond that. And I've learned to not go beyond that. So in some sense, that's where we got messed up this last spring. You know, we said, okay, we can't have graduation events in person uh, in the end of April. But looking out there, you know, in August, in September, I'll bet you it's going to be better, and I'll bet we can have an in-person event. Well, then numbers went up, and 
et cetera, et cetera, and the government and the state and all of that. And suddenly there I am having to say, gosh, I thought we could, but we can't. So I only predict one day in advance. So you're not going to get me to save what we're doing for graduation because, again, it could be a totally different scene and situation uh, in April of 2021. At the minimum, though, we've seen some really cool things that can be done virtually. Are they the same? Absolutely not, but they're still focused on what that moment means for each student, which is celebrating that diploma and then sharing that with family and friends. And, you know, what can we do there? Um, we've seen actually some really, like I said, there's been some really cool uh, things that have been done that way. So we'll definitely have something to celebrate graduation at the time the students should graduate. Um, what can we do for seniors? Well, actually, James Morales, Vice President of Student Affairs, is starting to focus on this. One thing was, as you know, we're going to start sports, particularly football. Our social distancing says, well, based on our situation here in Cache Valley, maybe we can only do 25% of the tickets. Are there certain games where seniors will have priority? Um, basketball, seniors have priority. You know, build memories that only they can, you know, that they're not going to get a chance next year to have to build those same memories. So we're trying to think of memories that they can have. Not that we don't care about all our other students, but we think they'll have another year or two to create those. I'd like to return back to the online classes. We're getting a lot of people, students, who say, I don't like online classes. Why won't you go back to in-person classes? And I think there's a simple explanation for that. If you step back, CDC guidelines, which we have to follow, say if you've been in contact with someone who's been positive for more than 15 minutes with less than six feet, you will have to go into quarantine for 14 days. So when we sat in our classrooms, we said, well, we could do assigned seating, and then if a positive person was identified, everyone that was in a perimeter of six feet would have to quarantine for 14 days later. Okay, that's one approach. Unfortunately, it could be your instructor that would have to quarantine, but it would be this revolving, rotating thing to sweep those two, this group's out for two weeks, next day these are out for two weeks, next group this is, and a positive person could, in total, be at five or six classes. So every one of those classes would have that. Instead, our social distancing, which does limit the number of students that can be in class at any one time, said even if a positive person was in that class, because we are sure that everybody stays six feet apart from each other, no one in that class has to quarantine. So we're protecting the people, the other people in the class. That reduced our numbers. How are we going to teach everybody? And that moved more to online. The second thing that people kind of forget, our students, is we have a lot of other people on campus, staff and faculty. And the faculty were nervous. Are students going to wear masks? Are they going to stay social distancing? Are they going to come to class when they're sick? And they're worried about their own health. So we did have, um, oops, I just put my hand over my camera or my speaker. Um, we did have started out about 16% of the faculty wanted to be online. By the time we got to fall semester, 37% of the faculty wanted to be online. And I cannot say, too bad, you need to come into yeah. class. I think if this works, continues to work as well as it is in fall semester, we will, could potentially have more faculty willing to do the in-person sessions within their classes. So let's keep going. Let's keep doing the preventative measures. If you're positive or if you're in quarantine, please, please, please do that. We're going to have testing, more available testing, quicker turnaround. And if you're positive, it's just, it's just 
for two weeks, right? Hopefully not longer. Hopefully the medical condition doesn't evolve. But it's a, it's a period of incredible requirements of people to be flexible. Flexible, resilient, positive, care about others. And we'll get through it. We'll get through it. Our people are bothered now. I see more light at the end of the tunnel for the future. And I'd like, I'd like us all to remember that. It's a crazy time. We'll never forget it. Um, but we'll, we'll get through it. Well, who can so. say they lived through a global pandemic? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I was a student. <laughs> yes. Well, I really appreciate your time and I really appreciate your positivity. I think that's something that we all need right now. Um, oh, good. Yeah, good. and I, I think people at Utah State have been very creative in the, in the way, you know, the online events and um, it's, it's very fun to see that. And even, you know, me as an RA, I've been having to come up with some virtual events and it's been very, it's been very interesting, but it's been like, you know, flexing the creative muscle in your brain, right. so. Well, exactly. <laughs> we got, we have to stay positive. It will end, you know, there's, there's things we can't control, federal, state guide requirements, all of that, new information, et cetera, et cetera. So the flexibility is, and creativity is very, very important.